One of the toughest things about learning GPS is keeping all the different acronyms straight in your head. We know the GPS system can be augmented in various ways to make it more precise for IFR flying, and we may be familiar with terms like RAIM and WAS, but what are they? What's the difference? And can we have one without the other? The GPS system consists of a constellation of satellites orbiting at around 11,000 miles, at speeds allowing them to circle the Earth every 12 hours. With at least 24 satellites in the main network, and some additional ones as well, many places on Earth usually have signal coverage from multiple satellites at a time. This is a good thing, as there's a minimum number of satellites required for the receivers like on our aircraft to properly work. We need to have reception of signals from at least four different satellites in order to determine our position accurately. Because the satellites are in motion relative to the ground, at 12-hour orbits they move faster than the Earth is rotating, we have different satellites in view at any given time. With enough satellites in the full network though, we should be able to pick up the minimum number for navigation. At times, satellites can develop faults, and if one of the four that we're using is faulty, our receiver could compute a position different than where we actually are. Sometimes these differences don't amount to much, but depending on the geometry of the satellites we're receiving, it could cause a larger error than what's acceptable on an IFR flight. Older GPS units, suitable for IFR flight, but without any ground-based augmentation, are identified by the FAA as TSO-129 or 196. An example would be the Garmin 430 or 530 without what's called a WAS capability. A faulty signal on these units would not appear to be any different to the user than any other accurate one would. The integrity of the position can't be assured. The way to correct for this is by receiving signals from more than the minimum four satellites. If a fifth satellite is visible, a series of positions can be computed using a combination of any four satellites at a time. If one of the position computations is different from the others, due to one of the satellite signals being faulty, that signal can be ignored, and the position will be computed using the four remaining birds. This is called Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring, or RAIM. As we could see here, a minimum of not just four, but five satellites is required for RAIM to be available. With one of the satellites excluded from the position computation, we're down to a minimum of four operative ones again. This doesn't necessarily mean that RAIM is unavailable now. The unit accepts only the position computed off the four satellites that are in agreement with each other. Some units are able to exclude the faulty satellite altogether using fault detection and exclusion. By ignoring the fifth satellite completely, full integrity monitoring can continue, but only if a new sixth satellite is in view providing a check against the four satellites that are working and included by the receiver. RAIM availability is based off the position of the satellites, which can be predicted to a very fine accuracy due to their stable orbits. For a given flight route at a given time, we're able to compute how many satellites will be available in the network, and thus when RAIM will or won't be available. If at least the main network of 24 satellites is available, RAIM coverage is assured. The modern GPS system of 31 satellites guarantees an almost 100% RAIM coverage rate. However, there are still instances where RAIM will be unavailable. These can be checked using an FAA tool or prediction software. ForeFlight provides a method of inputting a flight route and time of departure and arrival and computing whether RAIM will be available or not. Using these older units, an IFR flight can't be made without an alternate form of navigation suitable for the route like VOR. If a RAIM outage is predicted for a flight, we could still fly at IFR as long as we're using those alternate forms of navigation as our primary source now. RAIM capability is based off the error tolerance of the unit, which changes depending on our phase of flight. During the en-route phase, we have the largest tolerance at plus or minus two miles. In the terminal phase, this is down to one, and in the approach phase, on an RNAV approach for example, this shrinks to just 0.3 miles. If we have a loss of RAIM during or prior to the approach, we have to discontinue the RNAV approach, fly an approach with a different nav aid, or divert somewhere where RAIM is available. Okay, so that's RAIM. What about WAS? Many of our newer GPS units are WAS enabled. What does this mean, and do we still need to worry about RAIM? WAS includes the general GPS satellite constellation we already talked about. More than three times higher than these satellites in an orbit around the equator sit some other hardware. These are geostationary satellites. Their high orbit requires a slower speed, the same speed the Earth rotates at. 
which causes them to appear from the observer on the ground to remain motionless. They're always directly above some fixed point along the equator. Together, all of these satellites make up part of an even more precise navigation aid called the Wide Area Augmentation System, WAS for short. GPS is a U.S. military system and is designed for global usage. WAS is an FAA program and is designed for civilian aircraft operating in the National Airspace System, i.e. the United States. Again, the GPS satellites are constantly in motion relative to the ground, while the geostationary satellites hang over a fixed point on the equator, the southern sky as viewed from the northern hemisphere in the U.S. The GPS satellites, being again very fancy clocks with radios, transmit a signal down towards the ground in all directions. An aircraft equipped with the GPS receiver picks up these signals. As long as a minimum number of satellites, for most purposes this is four, are being received, the onboard unit can compute a position for the aircraft. But we kind of have to take the receiver's word for it. We aren't positive of our exact location, especially since we're moving over the ground at a decent speed. These signals aren't perfect and are prone to errors due to position, radio interference, and a number of other factors. Can we check the accuracy of the system off a known position? We could do so using a series of 38 ground stations spread out over North America. These are the wide area reference stations, wide area being the WA in the WAS acronym. These stations are surveyed to an exact latitude and longitude position and elevation above sea level. The stations receive GPS signals and compute a position the same way we do. Though unlike us in our aircraft, they know their exact position and can compare it to the GPS computed position to determine errors. If the error is due to one satellite not functioning properly, the station will know to ignore it and use a position computed with another series of satellites. By the way, this error correction principle is similar to what's done with RAIM, but it's done continuously and much more accurately, and there are almost never planned outages. So that information and other position errors will be transmitted by all stations by terrestrial link to master stations. There are three. Here we see the stations transmitting their data to one of them, the one in Georgia. The master station is a computer system that collects all the error messages and generates a user message. The user message is instructions for GPS receivers like the one on our aircraft on how to handle the errors detected by the system. This message is beamed by uplink dishes to the geostationary satellites in the southern sky above the equator. This happens every second. For our aircraft, we receive the GPS signal as normal, but due to all the errors we talked about, there could be some variance between our reported position and where we actually are. If our GPS receiver is WAS enabled, meaning it's able to receive the user message generated by the WAS system, we could take our GPS position and augment, this is the second A in WAS by the way, the data with the error info we get from the geostationary satellite. This takes a good deal of the error away. A non-WAS corrected GPS position can be expected to be accurate up to 5 meters. With WAS enabled, the accuracy gets down to less than 1 meter. This may not seem like much in a sky that stretches on for miles in front of us, but it can make a huge difference in the types of instrument approaches we're capable of flying. This RNAV approach requires us to have an appropriate GPS receiver on board. A standard, non-WAS unit will be fine, but the degree of inaccuracy, especially in terms of altitude, can be restrictive. With WAS, the inaccuracy goes away, and we can actually follow a GPS-derived glide path, just like we would on an ILS, and fly this approach as we would a precision, allowing us to use lower minimums, the LPV numbers, and treat the minimum as a decision altitude, as opposed to using the higher LNAV minimums for units without WAS, which are treated as a minimum descent altitude, the same way we would any non-precision approach, such as a VOR. Most newer GPS units are equipped with a WAS receiver. Make sure you know what you're working with as you plan your IFR flights. So here's the kicker. If you're flying with a WAS-enabled unit, you generally don't need to check for RAIM coverage or worry about a RAIM outage during the flight. However, if WAS is not available for some reason or downgraded, the GPS receiver will revert to non-WAS operation and RAIM may be required. You should monitor for WAS NOTAMs during pre-flight, especially if you'll be shooting approaches with vertical guidance. For more IFR insights and full ground schools, check the link here and in the description.